Hello and welcome everybody to the new National Trends in Disability Employment or NTID Lunch and Learn series. On the first Friday of every month, corresponding with the Bureau of Labor Statistics Jobs Report, we'll be offering this live broadcast via Zoom webinar to share the results of the latest NTIDE findings. In addition, we will provide news and updates from the field on disability employment, as well as host panelists who will discuss current disability-related findings and events. So just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Um, we will post an archive of each of our webinars each month at our website, www.researchondisability.org backslash NTIDE. Uh, this site will also provide copies of the presentations today, the panelist bios, full transcripts, and other valuable resources. As an attendee of this webinar, you are a viewer and no sound is enabled. To ask questions of the panelists, simply click on the Q&A box on your webinar screen and type your questions into the box. Panelists will review these questions during the assigned question and answer periods. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the NTIDE Lunch and Learn for November. I am Denise Roselle. I am the Director of Policy Innovation for AUCD, the Association of University Centers on Disability. And I am filling in for Andrew, who is usually here at this point. Um, but let's go to the next slide. Thank you. So um, as was just stated, the monthly NTIDE Lunch and Learn happens at noon Eastern on the day the NTIDE report is released. Um, that's a joint effort of UNH Institute on, the UNH Institute on Disability, the Kessler Foundation, and the Association of University Centers on Disability, AUCD. Um, as part of the Rehabilitation and Research Training Center on Employment Policy and Measurement, uh, which is funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, NIDLR. Um, that is who funds this project. Next slide. Um, let me tell you exactly what we're gonna do today. Uh, the first part, we go through the NTIDE monthly report, looking at the numbers, and John O'Neill from the Kessler Foundation is going to be doing that for us today. Then I come back to you and we're doing the NTIDE news and um, this, what's going on in the field. And normally we have a guest interviewee, we do not today, but uh, I do have some important things to share with you, some reports and some policy things happening in the field that affect employment. And then lastly, the guest speakers today um, are Dr. Andrew Houghtonville and Kimberly Phillips from the University of New Hampshire um, Institute on Disability. And so Andrew will be joining us later. We'll take all questions and answers for all parts of the program at the end. So um, hold your questions, or you can type them into the Q&A box, and um, they'll be monitored during the, uh, during the presentations, and then we can pick up the questions at the end. If they're simple things, somebody can answer them right away. If not, it's something we think everybody'd be interested in, then we'll raise those questions at the end. Uh, next slide. So, John O'Neill from the Kessler Foundation, I am going to turn it over to you for the NTIDE report. Okay, thank you, Denise. Uh, good day, everybody. Um, I'm John O'Neill from the Kessler Foundation, and I'll uh, report on the NTIDE numbers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the NTIDE report is essentially a, a press release and an infographic uh, looking at the latest employment statistics. Uh, specifically, uh, we look at the uh, employment to population ratio uh, as well as the employment participation rate. Um, and we um, use data from the jobs report that comes out um, on the first Friday of each month. Um, and it's a joint effort between the foundation and the University of New Hampshire. Next slide, please. Uh, the data is sourced from the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics from the current population survey, and it is the official unemployment rate, uh, well, which provides the official unemployment rate. And, um, the uh, CPS is conducted on civilians between 16 and 64 who are not living in institutions. And um, this information has been available since 2008 onward um, when the Census Bureau um, included the six disability questions um, on various federal surveys. Uh, the data is not seasonally ad 
adjusted and that's why we compare uh, the current month to the same month last year. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, now I'm going to uh, report the Entide numbers. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of the employment to population ratio, in October, people with disabilities, um, there was a 27.9% were employed, October 2016. And uh, last month in 2017, there were 30.5% who were employed. And this is an increase of 9.3% uh, from the previous year. In terms of people without disabilities, um, in October last year, there were 73.1% who were employed. And in uh, last month, uh, there were 73.7%, which is a 0.8% increase. As you can see, uh, folks with disabilities, uh, their improvement is outpacing that which people without disabilities are experiencing. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of um, uh, oh, I'm in terms of labor force participation, uh, people with disabilities, and by the way, labor force participation includes those that are working and those that are looking. Um, last year, people with disabilities, um, uh, the participation rate was 31.3%. And uh, last month, it was 33.3%, which is an increase of 6.4%. Amongst people without disabilities, uh, last year, the same month, there were 76.5% were per, uh, participating in the labor force, uh, whereas last month, it was up to 76.6%, which is a very small gain of only 0.1%. Again, people with uh, disabilities, the improvement is outpacing those uh, without disabilities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this particular graph shows uh, progress across time, or um, and as we can see, uh, for people um, without disabilities, um, they have um, almost totally recovered in terms of the employment to population ratio uh, from the Great Recession. Um, and that which began in 2008, if you look back, it was uh, their, uh, uh, their uh, the employment to population ratio was 70. 3.8% and just last month it was 73.7%. Uh, if you look at people with disabilities, um, you will see that uh, they, there has been an increase in the employment to population ratio from um, about late 2015 to just last month. Uh, prior to that, there was a downward trend from 2008. Um, uh, going forward with a, with a deep trough in, uh, uh, at the beginning of 2014, which we have slowly recovered from and are moving toward uh, the, uh, the employment to population ratio uh, that existed um, at the beginning of the Great Recession for people with disabilities. Next slide. Okay, Denise, I'll hand it back to you. Um, thank you. And I'm just quickly unmuting myself. Thanks a lot, John. Um, so let's go to the first slide. So um, in several months past, particularly over the summer, I updated all of you on what was going on on Medicaid reform and ACA reform, healthcare. Uh, the whole ACA repeal and replace. And I know some of you may have wondered why we were talking about that on an employment call. And the reason, as you recall, was because of the impact that those changes could make on Medicaid and on other employment-related services, 
obviously Medicaid pays for some of those services. So the same thing is going on here. I want to update you a little bit on budget appropriations and then on tax reform, not because it is a directly related um, to the employment issues that we all care about. Well, actually, it is directly related to the employment issues we all care about, and I want to tell you why. So the first thing is to make sure we all understand kind of where we are on federal policy um, and in the budget appropriations process. So the all right now, currently, all federal programs are operating under a continuing resolution. It's known as a CR that expires on December 8th. That means that we're working on and it's basically level funding. So it's something Congress has said, we can't decide what we're going to do, so we'll just continue what we were doing until we can make a decision. And that decision point comes on December 8th, as of right now. Um, none of the 12 annual appropriations bills were signed into law. The new fiscal year started on October 1st, and Congress had to do something. So that's there's a three-month CR. Um, the labor HHS education bills, which is where most of the programs that we care about in employment for people with disabilities. The Senate Appropriations Committee approved their version of it in September. The House Appropriations Committee completed its work in July. There's a lot of level funding. There are, there are some programs that are zeroed out, but for the most part, there's a lot of level funding. Um, but the rest of the work hasn't been done yet. Our assumption is that there will be an omnibus bill, which usually means that they roll all of the appropriation bills into one great big bill and pass it all together um, by, we, we're guessing December or so. So it's, it's unclear, well, it's guessing December. That would get us appropriations for the rest of this fiscal year um, through next um, September 30th. And we're anticipating December, we're gonna have to wait and see. The thing we don't know, and the thing to be paying attention to on this one, is that we are still under the uh, caps from discretionary funding from the 2011 budget control bill. The budget control bill said, you know, going forward year by year by year, there's a cap on how much you can spend on discretionary funding. We are still operating under that cap. We don't know if that cap will be changed. Um, if it isn't, there are gonna be continuing cuts coming because the departments will have to, to live with those discretionary cuts. Okay, so that's where we are in budget appropriations. Now, everything you've been reading in the paper recently about tax reform, and I'm sure you're all thinking it's very important and you're all paying attention, I want you to know why you should pay attention for purposes of the employment programs uh, for people with disabilities. So in late September, the administration and two congressional committees came out with what they called the Unified Framework for Tax Reform. And this outlined what they, how they were going to look at tax reform. Just this week, we've seen um, a bill, an actual bill be released in addition to the outline. And um, so on October 19th, the Senate passed a budget resolution, which says it has what's called reconciliation. I know this is a lot in the weeds, folks, but it really is important. Um, the Senate passed FY 2018 budget resolution um, that includes reconciliation instructions. And this is in the Senate. And those reconciliation instructions are important because it tells committees to develop legislation that only needs 50 votes. That's what had happened in the previous year around healthcare reform. It's why all of the fight happened to only get 50 votes for healthcare reform. The same thing's gonna happen on this, on federal tax reform. Um, so they instructed committees to come up with legislation around taxes and around um, increasing the federal, but the federal deficit. The reason this is important, and that the House also has a budget reconciliation plan, uh, has a, um, a budget that paves the way for tax reform. So the reason this is all important because it paves the way for tax reform um, and to do it with only 50 votes. And the reason this is important to you guys and the reason you need to be following it is because either, as if assuming tax reform passes, the outline that we've got and now the bill that we've got uh, will add trillions of dollars to the federal deficit. Um, or it will require, if, if folks don't want to add trillions of dollars to the federal deficit, it's going to require cuts to programs. The point is, 
if you don't raise the deficit, you've got to pay for it somehow. And it's doing it at such a large rate. And whether that'll happen this year or next year or the next year, we don't know. But ultimately, it's cutting taxes at such a rate that, um, that there's not going to be as much money for programming. Basically, that's the gist of it. Um, unless, I suppose, for those who believe that this tax cut will gin up the economy and really add that direction, um, then that would make a difference. So what I want you to pay attention to is for the purposes of the programs that we care about, we could be facing, including Medicaid, um, because frankly, there's at the amount that they're raising the taxes, uh, the, I'm sorry, at the amount that we will lose tax money, um, the amount that the, um, the uh, money coming into the federal government will decrease at such a rate that they're going to have to find money somewhere. And those places beyond the program, the programming discretionary money, are likely to be in places like Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, entitlement programs. So what I'm saying is this is yet another way to try and get to entitlement programs at the same time as cutting taxes. Um, I'm trying to do this as not, and I, I think disability is a nonpartisan issue, and I truly believe that. We need to be watching this one whether you're Democrat, Republican, where you fall on the spectrum, we need to be watching this because it really could have a huge impact on what we do on a day-to-day -day basis on behalf of and with people with disabilities. Um, okay, that's, that's the federal policy update. Um, keep an eye on it is the message. Even if you didn't get in the weeds with me and all the rest of it, keep an eye on this because it could have big impact um, in the near future. Okay, thank you, next slide. Now, going to some of the other things that are going on in the world, um, OSERS has the, um, the Office of Special Education, uh, the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitation Services, OSERS at the Department of Education, has just come out with their 2017 document that lists all of the transition-related activities happening in OSERS by component within the department. It also lists other federal resources and other Department of Education resources. Um, and it also talks some about some of the things that are coming, upcoming activities. There's all kinds of links in it. I know I talk to you guys once in a while about, you know, something I would pull off and stick in my file so that I could get to it and always have it to refer to. This is probably one of those um, programs you work on. If you have grants from OSERS, you're going to be in there around transition. So it gives you an idea of the kinds of things that the federal government is funding around transition services and links to updates on exactly what is going on in those projects. They do it yearly, it just came out. And there's a link in the slide. Next slide. Um, this is another one that's just come out. This one is on youth, uh, young adults and transitioning youth with autism spectrum disorder. It's the same kind of a report that is mandated by the Autism Cares Act to say what are the federal initiatives focusing on transition for youth and young adults with autism. And again, it's a way to look at what's going on. There are actually recommendations in it as well for how we can better coordinate um, the approaches that are going on. The, one of the recommendations, no surprise to anyone on this call, is that we need a better coordinated system. Um, another one is to look at the systems um, that exist and the gaps in those systems and what we need to do for those. And there's also some data and research recommendations. And again, for folks on this call, I would think that would be um, of huge interest. Again, there are links in the slide. Next one. Um, paid, this is an, another interesting one that I don't think we in this field um, look at as often as we should. And I'm thrilled to see that the ARC is doing this. Um, it, Paid, it's on paid family and medical leave and disability. Um, there is a, there's a study, there's a whole page actually on the ARC webpage with all kinds of things there. Federal proposals, lists of state leave policies, lists uh, and examples of employer paid leave policies, and how paid leave promotes employment and economic security and stability for people with disabilities and their families. Again, there are policy recommendations there and some very specific stories and examples. This is a really good resource, and I don't think we pay enough attention um, as someone, quite frankly, who worked for a long time to help pass family medical leave years and years ago. I don't think we pay enough attention to the impact that this has had and continues to have on people with disabilities and their families. 
and being able to work. So I was thrilled to see this. It's a really good um, series of documents. And I, um, they did a webinar on it recently as well, but it was in the last month in October. I believe that that's up there and you can listen to it. But um, if not, there's a lot of good information up there. And, and we really need to be promoting this in ways that, um, that we haven't, as a community, in my opinion, um, that we haven't as much as we need to. So I absolutely recommend that one to all of you. Next one. Next slide. Okay. Um, now, now we've got a couple, um, in the last few months, I actually haven't had that many international things to share with you. So I was really excited to see a couple of international things um, come up this time. This one is um, in the European Journal of Work and Organizational Psychology in the October 2017 issue. And it's specifically around disability and employment. And it looks at what's going on across Europe. Um, it looks at the legal situation and compares Europe and North America. Um, it looks at, um, again, the complexity of defining disability, something I'm sure all of you are, are aware of barriers and enablers to employment, again, something I think you all are looking at, um, but it compares uh, and does a lit search on um, what's going on in Europe and what's going on in North America. Uh, next slide. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, and this is the next one. So that go back one for me, Art, if you were, whoever's running the slides. So this one is very specific. The link is there. Um, it's more of a literature search, I think, but it's, and talking about where more research is needed. I thought that was really interesting. Okay, the next one, thank you. So this is um, brand new out of the USBLN, the US Business Leadership Network, um, and the Center for Talent Innovation. It's called Disabilities and Inclusions, uh, Global Findings. This one, um, and USBLN did a really good job on this one. They always do a good job. This one is um, a survey. As you can see, it's 35, over 3,500 respondents between 21 and 65 in the U.S. and internationally. And it, I've got numbers for how many in each. But um, in the U.S., I thought one of the really interesting things that I'm not sure we pay enough attention to, 30% of college-educated employees working full-time in white-collar professions have a disability. Um, we don't always talk about those folks or about the 70% who don't, but or, uh, I'm sorry, back up one step. We don't always talk about those folks. 62% um, of employees with disabilities have invisible disabilities. I'm not sure that's a number that we, at least I didn't expect it to be that high. Maybe some of you would. Um, and then interesting too for millennials, 44% of millennials report they have a mental health condition which is higher than both for the boomers and the Gen Xers. Um, that's a really high number, and I hope it's something we pay more attention to than we have been. That's, um, that's a really high number. So anyway, I thought all of those numbers were really interesting. Um, next slide. Then when you looked international, or the same survey, looked internationally, they surveyed 500 respondents, 100 each from five different countries, Brazil, Germany, India, Japan, and the UK. Again, the same 21, between 21 and 64, employed full time in white collar occupations with at least a bachelor's degree. And each of these, there are a bunch of little factoids in there very much like these. I just pulled these out because I thought they were interesting. Um, in India, the incidence of visible disabilities is higher compared to the US, um, which may be why their disclosure rates to, to human resources are all, also high. Um, in Brazil, because of the federal quotas there, college-educated people with disabilities are highly sought after and are likely to disclose. A lot of what they were looking at, you can tell, is around disclosure and, um, and who discloses and why and where, the, if you compare um, disclosure rates. The UK has higher disclosure rates to HR for in invisible disabilities than in the US. I also thought that was interesting. Um, there is, I, I have in the last few days been at the, or yesterday actually, I was at the Harkin Summit here in DC, which is Senator Harkin's summit that brings together 250 people internationally to look at employment. And I highly recommend it next year for anyone who wants to come. It was fabulous, or it is fabulous. It's going on today as well. But I was talking to someone from the UK and one of the things that they were saying is that in the UK these days, they're having higher disclosure rates because 
there is a real push within industry to um, for disclosure, and not just disclosure of disability, but disclosure of anything. They're taking on an introduction that says, so I'd like to hire you. What do you need in your job to be successful? And that includes disability, but it also may include you need to get off at four o'clock in the afternoon to take care of your children. It also may include you need, I mean, whatever it may be, there, there, there's industry there looking at that broadly and asking broad questions which pull in disability. And that may be part of why indivisible, invisible disabilities are so much higher, uh, disclosure of those disabilities is so much higher in the UK. Again, I thought that was interesting. And then the last one, 34% who have mental health conditions feel they're being promoted quickly. I thought that was fascinating too. I'm not sure that that would be the case if you were to ask the 44% of millennials you saw on the previous slide um, who are reporting health con uh, mental health conditions that they feel the same. There was just a lot of interesting information in this one. Um, USBLN has a lot of background data that goes with it. Uh, it just came out, uh, again, they were just talking about this at the Harkin Summit yesterday as well. And, um, and I think I, I recommend it highly to all of you. Okay, next slide. And lastly, the, thing we, the only other thing I want to bring to your attention, um, a save the date. So the 2017 Annual Disability Statistics Compendium is February 13th from 9 to 2.30 at the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine in Washington, DC. There is a registration link here on the slide. And um, it's a fabulous, I went for the first time last year, and I am not a data geek. I tell people I am a policy geek. And, um, and I found it fascinating and you, know, you need the data to shape the policy. And so it was, uh, it was a fascinating day and uh, I really enjoyed it. I, again, for those in DC, I highly recommend it and save the date for February 13th. Okay, that's the, uh, flip to the next slide. That's the end of my part of this, um, of this day. I want to turn it over to our guest speakers now. And I can see Andrew and Kim have both joined us. So uh, I don't know who's gonna speak first. I'm gonna turn it over to Drs. Andrew Houghtonville and Kimberly Phillips from the University of New Hampshire Institute on Disability to talk about some new work that's out. Off to you guys. Thanks, Denise. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, so I guess that means I will go first. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody. Next slide. So this is uh, our presentation of the 2017 uh, Kessler Foundation National Employment and Disability Survey supervisor perspectives. And so uh, notice in the acronym on this slide that there's a semicolon, there's a colon between uh, KFED, NES, KF NEDS, however you want to say it, and, and SP. The idea is that um, we already did a national employment and disability survey from the perspective of workers and people with disabilities generally. Uh, and now we're doing one of supervisors. Next slide. So the main objective was to identify uh, the processes and practices used by employers to increase the employment of people with disabilities uh, and the effectiveness of these, uh, of these practices and processes. We also wanted to collect qualitative information and we'll be alluding to that uh, at various points in the, in the presentation to get information on specific practices and challenges uh, related to existing things that, that supervisors are doing, but also we didn't want to presuppose that we knew everything. So a lot of times we'll be asking, were there any other practices that you used? And, uh, so we want to get an idea of the things we don't know as well. And so we collect a lot of qualitative information in that area. Also, we wanted to, uh, one of the side things we did was to look at upper management commitment uh, it specifically. Uh, because it's been suggested by previous studies that having an upper management champion is really uh, very key to um, the employment of people with disabilities within a given organization. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to pass it off to Kim. And Kim, are you there? Yes. Hello. All right. Take it away. So for our survey, we um, were able to reach 3,085 supervisors from across the United States. 
the respondents were drawn from a Qualtrics business to business panel, which means that um, Qualtrics connected in advance with businesses and maintained uh, maintains a pool of potential respondents and we were able to select from this pool that we wanted to talk to supervisors from organizations with 25 or more employees. The main subject areas of the survey were recruiting and hiring, onboarding and training, and retention and accommodation of employees, including employees with disabilities. And within each of these broad subject areas, we looked at processes and practices and their effectiveness, as Andrew mentioned. We looked at supervisors and upper management commitment, and we collected qualitative data with some open-ended questions. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so, Briefly, some demographics of the supervisors who were surveyed. They were 59% were female, 77% were white, and uh, there was a broad range of ages from 18 uh, all the way up to, I think, our, our, our oldest respondent was 77. Um, most, 48%, were in between the ages of 35 and 54, and 76% had at least a college degree or higher. Next, please. We asked supervisors what experience they had with disability in their own lives, because we think this is an important covariate. It's possible that supervisors with some uh, disability experience will have slightly different perspectives. So we found that 45% uh, had at least some experience with disability. 18% uh, that was them, they themselves experienced a disability, and 39% um, it was someone close to them, whether that was a, a spouse, a sibling, um, a child, or a parent, or a colleague, uh, or friend. Okay, next slide, please. As I mentioned, we looked at organizations that were at least 25 employees so that it would um, fall under the regulations of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we had a range of organization sizes. 35%, which was the highest chunk, was, had 1,000 or more employees. Next slide, please. And we looked at some um, characteristics of the supervisor's experience. So, for example, um, people had been working at their organization anywhere from one year to, you know, who knows, 21 years or more. Most people had been there um, between one and 20 years, 85% between one and 20 years. Next. And there was a range of experience supervising. So not only was there a range of how long we've been with the company, but how long have we been in a supervisory position? 40% were, uh, had been supervising for two to five years. Next. And 36% uh, supervised between one and five people, 22% supervised 21 or more. So we really did have quite a broad range in our responses. Next, please. Now, we talked about supervisors' experience with disability. This um, next statistic is experience supervising employees with disabilities. And 51%, we were a, li uh, a little surprised and pleased that 51% of supervisors surveyed had supervised at least one person with a disability. 27% said they'd supervised someone with a cognitive disability, 26% with a mobility limitation, 20% had supervised someone with a hearing limitation, and 9% had supervised someone with a visual disability. Next, please. Andrew? Andrew? Sorry, I was, I was uh, muted. So next slide. So we're gonna look at, uh, go ahead and do another, another hit return again so we can see the first. Uh, go down. So next slide. And hit return again and again. All right. So uh, the first thing we did was look at uh, how 
the supervisor's visor fell upper management was committed to hiring people with disabilities. And so as you can see around 20% um, said that their, their supervisor was very committed and uh, sometimes committed was around 45%. Uh, the, we also asked, you know, how important was it to the supervisor, uh, him or herself, to hire people with disabilities? And you can see roughly the same distribution in terms of very important, somewhat important, not very important, and not at all important. So this is interesting because they're kind of saying that, you know, they're, they're holding the same perspectives as their employer. Uh, next slide. And hit return a couple times. So now we looked at, at, okay, what about supporting people with disabilities learn their job? So here we see 42% said that upper management was very committed. However, when we look at the supervisor and, and how him or her uh, felt it was uh, important, they said very important. Uh, a great many of them said very important, much more important than was signified with, uh, with upper management commitment. And next slide. So we're gonna look at uh, provided requesting accommodation, requested accommodations. So uh, again, you know, pretty good score, you know, very important for almost half, the, half of the upper management um, uh, in, in terms of the view of the supervisor. And go ahead and hit return again. But again, we see a similar pattern to helping people uh, with disabilities learn their job, uh, that it is very important, much more important, uh, relative to uh, the commitment of upper management. And so if you think about the three slides we just looked at, you know, hiring people with disabilities, that's a, that's a pretty broad concept, you know. Everybody seems to be able to get behind it. But when it comes to providing detailed support for people with disabilities to learn their job, or when it comes to providing requested accommodations, supervisors, uh, you know, kind of their perceptions of the importance of those things are much more important than they feel upper management is committed to those things. And so this, this kind of strikes to some of my experiences that it's very easy uh, to say, yes, of course, you know, we're all behind hiring people with disabilities, but when it comes to actually providing specific training or providing specific accommodations, there's, there's much more, it's a bigger process, it's a bigger commitment, um, uh, albeit a very important commitment. And so, uh, this was a really interesting finding, um, uh, and uh, I, we, we can thank Kim for adding these questions because I, I, they, I, I poo pooed the idea. But I, I think this is a really fascinating finding that you know it, it may not be just upper management commitment, but the follow through uh, to the more detailed uh, things that occur. So uh, next slide, and Kim, you're taking over, right? Sure. Okay, so we're now looking at organizational processes, and then we'll pass back to Andrew to look at specific practices. Uh, so we asked each, for each topic area, we asked, does your organization have a process? If so, is it effective? And if so, is it as effective for people with disabilities? And this was very important. We felt this was a good innovation of our survey because we were able to provide some context for um, establishing effectiveness for people with disabilities. If we had skipped the middle saying, is this process effective for employees in general, we would not necessarily know, um, you know, we would not have that baseline to compare to. So next slide, please. Next. So 84% said that their organization had a process for recruiting new employees. Next. And of those 84%, 90% felt that their current process was effective. Next. Of those, 61% felt it was as effective for people with disabilities. So now you can see um, how this sort of descending questions uh, worked out. And we see that, okay, the recruiting process actually is not so great when it comes to people with disabilities. Okay, next slide, please. We asked, um, do you spend moderate to a lot of effort on recruiting? And 74% said yes, they spent moderate to a lot of effort recruiting in general. 69% said they spent moderate to a lot of effort recruiting for diversity, 
whereas fewer, 44%, said they spent moderate to a lot of effort recruiting people with disabilities. So here we have some opportunity for improvement. Next. 57% of the supervisors said their organizations had hiring goals related to diversity, but only 20% said they had hiring goals related to disability. Um, then this 12% 12 uh, 12 of people who hire for diversity said that diversity included people with disabilities. So um, that was a bit of a disappointment and think, we think there is some opportunity there to encourage people to include disability when they're talking about diversity goals. Okay, next slide please. Next. 86% of supervisors said that they had, uh, their organization had a process to, to support new employees to learn their jobs. Next. 93% of those felt the process was very effective. And next. 73% felt it was as effective for people with disabilities. So very encouraging news. Next slide, please. Next. We asked if uh, organizations had a process to request accommodations, and 66% of supervisors said yes. Next, of those, nearly all felt that their process was effective. And so this is important. For those 34% um, who do not have a process, we know that those who have one find it very useful. And the next, of those who have a process, um, only 59% said that it is discussed at new employee orientation. Next slide, please. Okay, we asked, um, does your organization have a centralized accommodation fund, which is something that uh, em employers can use to draw from when accommodations are requested? Uh, only 16% said yes, that they had a centralized accommodation fund. Next, of those who did, 94% felt that it was effective in being able to meet requests for accommodations when they arose. Next, please. Okay, and back to Andrew for specific practices. All right, so we're going to follow a similar uh, strategy and try to baseline the practice when we can to is it effective and then is it effective for people with disabilities. Um, and then one thing we're going to also uh, think about is, um, was it feasible uh, to, to have that, uh, to do that practice? Uh, and because we want to get a sense of, if you didn't do the practice, what could you have done that practice to get a sense? So let's go on to the next slide. So the first thing we wanted to look at is recruiting uh, par uh, partners with disability recruiting and whether you partner with a disability organization. And so uh, not too many said that they actually did uh, participate, uh, collaborate with partners, uh, partner with disability organizations in recruiting about 27%. Next. And so of those, however, even though it's a small group, 98% said it's effective. So that, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, next. And of the, the people who didn't know or, or know, they didn't use it, uh, quite a few said that, that it, it's feasible, you know? Um, and so uh, with the idea that it's feasible for those folks and really effective for the folks that actually used it, this, this uh, uh, really represents a great opportunity to, to spread a, a practice that is effective. So next slide. We also have a similar uh, kind of sequences for short-term outside assistance. So think of this as, say, a job coach. Um, and so uh, very few, again, say that they actually did it, so 19%. Uh, next. Um, of the people who, who actually do it, though, uh, or did it sometimes, it's actually quite effective. Uh, so 89% said that it was effective um, uh, of the people who actually used it and slightly less effective for the people that said sometimes they use it. And maybe that's why they sometimes use it. It's not as effective. In terms of the node, so next. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then as effective for people with disabilities, uh, pretty good still, you know, that it's still holding out that short-term outside assistance is effective, uh, uh, not only for the overall population, but for the population with disabilities. Uh, now next. So in terms of the people who didn't use it, is it, do they think it's feasible? 
Um, and you know, 70% said that it is feasible to do so. Uh, and so this again represents an opportunity for uh, bringing in outside folks uh, to assist in helping people learn their job, uh, people with disabilities, you know, get comfortable within the work environment and learn their specific tasks. Um, and it, it could be quite effective. It could be a really in good in place for, for supporting organizations to hire a, and onboard people with disabilities. So next slide. All right, so we looked at on-site training um, uh, by supervisors or coworkers. So 70% uh, said, yeah, of course, that, that's actually how we do it here at, at New Hampshire is a lot of the training will come from supervisors and coworkers next. So is it effective? And it's very effective for overall. Um, and then next, is it effective for people with disabilities? Yes. Uh, next. And the little no feasible. So this isn't, so this is, you know, uh, I think that the story is actually the bottom part that this kind of approach is as effective for people uh, with disabilities as it is without. One of the things we have is the open-ended questions uh, and, and we could uh, actually look at those to see for people who it wasn't effective, we asked why, uh, and we could look at why this isn't as effective. So next slide. Um, let's do, let's go, Go through a, let's go through this one. So we do the same process, keep next, next, next. So for the sake of time, um, you know, this job sharing is not frequently used uh, and uh, it seems to be pretty effective. Um, and, but the feasibility is low for the ones that don't use it. Uh, was it feasible? Um, and so I'm thinking that a lot of jobs are, are, we, we think about the economy really moving fast, but there are many jobs that, that aren't shareable. Um, uh, and, and so uh, it seems to be an effective practice, and, and so it's, it's helpful to know uh, if, if, the job, if jobs move in this direction where people are sharing jobs, uh, that it's effective for both people with and without disabilities. So next, uh, flexible scheduling. So let's do this again. So next, next, next. All right, and next. All right, and so this is similar to the job sharing. You know, not a lot are using it. Um, sometimes they're using it. Uh, you know, flexible scheduling is usually, um, it can happen with many jobs automatically, but a lot of times it's, it's upon a request. And, and notice that a lot of the people who, who said no really didn't think it was feasible. Uh, so this is an interesting kind thought we need to dig a little deeper to get some some more nuanced information about job flexibility or flexible schedules let's do the next one next 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 so working from home uh, it actually and one more thank you so working from home is similar you know uh, the folks that seem to be using it it's effective it's as effective for people without this with disabilities so that's a good sign um, and but it doesn't seem to be very feasible. So next, how many of these do we have? So cultural co training, yeah. So there you go. Uh, so cultural cultural competence training. Uh, um, you know, uh, it, many firms are doing it, or frequently done it, or have done it in the past. It seems to be effective uh, and seems to be feasible. Now, uh, the the one question we we want to you know when we go further with this kind of research is to, um, you know, it's effective at meeting its goal, perhaps, but is it effective at increasing retention or increasing the cultural uh, environment, uh, improving the cultural environment? Um, that's, a, that's something we can explore, uh, perhaps with the open-ended questions, but also uh, in the future. Next. So areas of future analysis. Uh, Kim, why don't you go ahead and take this over? Andrew, Kim had to step away. So, or do, John, do you want to take it? Or Andrew, do you want to continue? If John wants to take it, John can take it. But for the sake of time, let, let, let me just go ahead and rip through these. So we want to investigate company size, years uh, of experience, some of the other variables that we have. We also want to look at uh, the relationship to disability type and the experience that the individual supervisor has. Um, and most importantly, we want to look at um, the open-ended questions. That's where we're kind of at now is, is uh, drawing up plans to 
to really focus on those open-ended questions, to find out some of the things we don't know, um, you know, some of the things that, that they reveal to us that, that aren't on our radar screen. And then we also asked recontact information for, uh, for, the sam for half of the sample, um, actually for, for 3,000 individuals. Uh, and so we're looking to do follow-up, potentially follow-up questionnaires to delve deeper into some of the specific issues, perhaps, or to look at disability type more specifically. So next, um, you know, uh, findings uh, to improve corporate culture. Uh, I, I think that, um, you know, underutilized but effective practices is what we're really looking for. And common practices uh, uh, that are effective, and many are universal design, so they work with and without disability. And uh, focusing on the upper management commitment, uh, not just in the hiring, or the overall idea of employing people with disabilities, but when it gets down to the nuts and bolts. And so why don't we open it up for questions? I, I really don't want to leave too much, I want to leave as much time as possible. So let's, let's stop there and open up for questions. Terrific. Um, I can see one question in the question box, Andrew, if you want to take that. Um, do you have or can you share specific data on the responses from supervisors with disabilities? Since those folks can reflect on their experiences as supervisors and as people with disabilities. Yeah, that's, that, you know, that's one of the things we're gonna be doing and, and that's one of the variables that, that is gonna be really fascinating because for me, they might actually see things as being less effective. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not because they didn't in implement it as effective, but they have higher expectations. Uh, so it could go either way. They could be better at implementing these things and or they could have higher expectations. So it'll be really fascinating to look at at uh, not just the quantitative, res qualitative re quantitative results, but the qualitative results for those, those folks. Thanks. Um, I want, uh, the only other question, and I'll just, I'll just reflect back for a second on my, I got a question around the tax reform bill and a couple of other things that are in the brand new bill that was released this, um, this week. And I have to be honest to say that I have not been through it um, with a fine tooth comb to say the least. I know that there is a move to get rid of the medical deduction, which clearly would have an effect on people with disabilities. Um, and then someone in the chat box told me, which I did not know, uh, or in the, the question box, that it also apparently is doing away with the, eh, I just looking for it, um, the small business deduction to improve accessibility. Um, that's mm. section 3407 of the tax plan which obviously would have an effect on small business uh, employing people with disabilities. So that's another one. I, I believe there is also something around the um, uh, medical devices, a deduction for medical devices that may also have been de deleted or you know, zeroed out. I have not seen that one for sure, but I have heard that. So I bear in mind, I give you, you that with a grain of salt. Let me see if we have other questions. Um, okay, here's another question, Andrew. So great webinar, thanks. Um, do you have stats on sector-specific results on most effective practices for recruiting and strategic alliances with disability organizations? Uh, so uh, we do have the ability to run those. We haven't run those yet. Um, uh, and by sector, uh, we mean industrial sector. Uh -huh. I don't think we got... Uh, say, uh, federal, state, local, government uh, versus private. So we will be, we will be generating those um, in terms of the, the effectiveness of reaching out to, mm -hmm. to other organizations and, and, and really look at the ones that aren't doing it. So are there industrial sectors or types of companies that are not reaching out? Mm -hmm. Terrific, thank you. That's the only other question we have in the question box. Oops, here comes another one. Um, so another question, uh, when the employer states, we welcome diversity, um, should clarity be sought by asking, does that include disability? Oh, I would say that's an affirmative. Um, and, and, you know, I, I was sitting at a meeting uh, a, lot, a, a few days ago, I was at a meeting and same kind of thing, different issue. Um, and there was a diversity representative and they felt no kind of uh, responsibility to, 
to ensure disability was uh, on the table yeah. a couple of days ago. And, and I, I think that there is a, uh, a lot of, uh, certainly within human resources, there's a lot of coursework. And I, I really think that this is work where academia really needs to step up and mm -hmm. Society of Human Resources Management needs to step up and, and really push the idea of disability uh, uh, being a part of diversity goals. Uh, and also uh, the things that they advocate for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so very good question. Thank you so much. These are really good questions. Um, anybody else? Again, I'll, I'll wait a second. There's no other questions in the chat box that I'm seeing. I'll wait a minute to see if anybody else is typing something. But, but oops, like I said, um, what would you like to illuminate in the next national employment survey that you did not do this time? Oh, oh. Uh, yeah, so I really think that a lot of challenges are related to specific, I'd like to focus on very specific practices and issues, um, uh, particularly around mental health um, and medical leave and how those things are really handled and how accommodations are handled and how um, uh, medical leave is handled. Those can be really sticky issues with how people are, are treated. Um, and, and the other thing I would do is I'm looking forward to being able to go into the, the qualitative results and see if there are really interesting practices that we've just, a lot of these questionnaires are designed based on what we know. Okay, how frequently do you use this practice? How frequently do you use this practice? Um, and, and really get at practices that we just don't know a lot about. Um, uh, and so that's that's what I would add to the next national survey. Nice. Okay, John, did you one have more a, thing? Go ahead, John. Yeah, I just had one more thing. We uh, we have the fortune. Uh, we are fortunate to um, be able to increase the N uh, to over six thousand individuals, which will give us uh, a lot more detail. That's fabulous. Okay. Well, seeing no other questions, thank you all. Thank you, as always, for joining us every month on the Entide Lunch and Learn. Um, we look forward to being with you next month on the first Friday of the month. And um, in the meantime, if you've got questions or on any of the things you saw today, feel free to reach out to any of us um, and pass the word. This is a, I'd say a lot of times, I think this is a, um, a hidden gem um, if I can say that, for what's going on in employment, uh, in the employment world. So pass the word and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.